there were several options for texts for the sermon this morning. Most of them were really difficult. <laughs> the punt was the one about the little children being welcomed to by Jesus, but I chose a more difficult text. The text will be from the letter to the Hebrews. Last week we gathered around this font to welcome Meg and Matt Potter into this household of faith. There was a time when we would have just asked them to stand where they were and then smile as I announced that the session last week had received them into membership in the church. Instead, we asked them to come up here so we could ask them some questions. Do you trust in God's gracious mercy? Do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? And getting down to brass tacks, who is your Lord and Savior? We ask this, these questions to Meg and Matt, not because we wanted to assure ourselves that they are worthy to be members of this church. Church membership is not a matter of passing a test or meeting a requirement. We ask them because these are the very same questions we should be asking ourselves every time we enter this sanctuary, or even better, every time we open our eyes and wake to a new day. Do you trust in God's sovereign mercy? Do you turn from evil and toward the light? Who is your Lord and Savior? Answering these questions with words is a start, but it's just a start. Together, as a community of believers, we invited Matt and Meg into this community where we are trying to live the answers to those questions. We aren't looking for assent to orthodox doctrine. You'll recall we didn't ask them if they were single or double predestinarians or if they uh, had some opinion about infant baptism. No, we just wanted to know, are you headed more or less in the same direction that we are toward a merciful God, away from the structures and powers that corrupt creation and break God's heart, toward Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The writer of the letter to Hebrews is interested in these questions and has as much concern for the churches to him to whom he is writing. In some ways, the letter to the Hebrews can be read as a letter to us today, but in many ways, it is a letter very hard for modern 21st, 21st century Christians to relate to. To begin with, the readers of this letter, or rather the hearers, for clearly this letter was meant to be read out loud, they are very familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures. I mean, these people know their Bible. They, they think in biblical and uh, terms and in biblical metaphors. It seems they also seem to know the rules of Hellenistic rhetoric. This is a sophisticated audience that appreciates a rousing exordium full of verbal devices such as alliteration and assonance and chiasmus. You don't have to speak ancient Greek in order to understand this letter, but it sure helps. And if you did, you would be really impressed. This is not somebody sending tweets with two thumbs. This is a skilled orator who knows his craft. Think Daniel Webster or my predecessor in this pulpit, Bruce Robertson. The writer of Hebrews is an artist who paints with words and his palette is the whole of salvation history from creation right to the full redemption of the world at the end of time. And the thread that runs through it all, the writer says, is Jesus. Long ago, 
God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways through the prophets, but in these last days, God has spoken by a son. That son is a no newcomer to the cosmic stage. It was through him that God created the worlds. God was present. God, the son, was present at creation, just like Lady Wisdom in the in the book of Proverbs, standing there at creation with her architectural plans rolled up under her arm. The son is the appointed heir of all things, the inheritor of creation as well as the agent of its creation. The son, says the writer, sustains all things by his powerful word. Remember in the first chapter of Genesis, how God speaks and the light covers the earth and is separated from the darkness. God speaks and humankind is created, male and female. All it takes is the word of God and the Son is this same word, the word that keeps creation going. Now, if we were listening to the opening verses of the Gospel of John, we would expect the writer then to say, the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of faith and truth, grace and truth. But this, this, this writer is sticking with the Bible, with the Hebrew imagery and story. According to his way of visualizing the created order, every creature has its place on the great ladder of being. I don't know, let's see, tadpoles are down here someplace, and then, I don't know, bed bugs way down here, and then, and then human beings toward the top, and then angels in close proximity to God. You can't get any higher than angels. Oh yes, you can, says the writer of Hebrews. Jesus is higher than the angels. Jesus sits at the very right hand of the throne of God. His is the word that sustains the cosmos. His is the, he is the son who is heir of creation. Jesus is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being. But Jesus does not retain this lofty place. Jesus has a task to do, a, a job to carry out. He has to put the world right again. A world that has lost its way. A world that has gone way off kilter. To accomplish his world restoring mission, the son for a little while, the writer says, relinquished his lofty place and climbed down that ladder past the angels, by Gabriel, by seraphim and cherubim. Not you guys. I'm, this, this is imaginary, okay? <laughs> right down to where we live. Right down to the level where sin has disrupted the divine order, where hearts are broken and marriages end in divorce, where violence reigns on battlefields, and within homes where the poor are exploited and the rich resist their cries for justice, where young people are slain by the gun attending a class at community college, and no political leader can be found who seems to want to do anything about it. There, says the writer, right down in the mess that is our human experience, the Son made purification for our sins. He suffered, he died, he rose again. And in doing that, he redeemed the world. He set the world on a new course. The Son did all of this out of love to show the grace of God. For in the writer's way of thinking, only the one who was the agent of creation can be the agent of creation's redemption. In Hebrews speak, only the Son could make purification for our sins. Only the Son could taste 
death for everyone. That restorative death of Jesus on the cross changed humanity's place in the great order of things. The writer of Hebrew asserts, now you and I share his exalted positions. We are now his brothers and sisters, fellow heirs with Christ. He is not ashamed to claim us as his closest kin, the pioneer of our salvation, has claimed us as his sisters and brothers. What I have just given you is a kind of Reader's Digest version of the opening verses of Hebrews. A lot gets lost in translation, but you, you can get the idea, or at least the feeling, of the great sweep of these soaring words Jesus is more than a moral teacher, more than a performer of miracles, more than a figure of history. He is the reflection of God's glory, the very imprint of God's own being. We can't see God, but we can see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering and death. Now, the writer lived in the first century. And you and I live in the 21st century. We don't tend to think in terms of a hierarchical universe or a great ladder of being with humans moved up a notch past the angels close to God. This is not scientific language. It's spiritual. It's, it, it's doxological language. It's the stuff of hymns and songs and spiritual songs. And of course, it's all true. True in the way it speaks to our hearts. True in the gratitude of grace it evokes. True because it gives us a way to praise God in the language of our ancestors in the faith. One scholar suggests that these opening verses of Hebrews are like an oratorical Eucharist, <laughs> a great offering of thanksgiving using words. Today is World Communion Sunday, the day when we remember and enact our unity in Christ by gathering around this table to make Eucharist. When I say or I sing, lift up your hearts and you say or sing back to me, we lift them to the Lord. We are beseeching the Holy Spirit to raise us up into heaven where the risen Christ is present and there to dine upon the bread of heaven, the cup of salvation. We are lifted up with him heirs of creation. I guess you could say this meal is a cosmic family reunion. Jesus, who invites us, is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. We jump the queue. We go past the angels. We are lifted on high to taste the bread of heaven. So what do you think about that? Well, I know we're Presbyterians and all that, but I think just don't think about it too much. Let's just receive it as a gift of pure grace. Let's sing and chant and rejoice for that which we know to be true but have only our flat, one-dimensional 21st century words to give it expression. We need these old words, these gospel images, these words of our brothers and sisters in the faith. We need this heavenly feast, this foretaste of God's coming reign right now, especially now. We need them. And when the words are finished, the feast continues.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.